subject of today's session is a biblical holy day that admittedly is relatively obscure. In fact, I suspect that most people are completely unaware of its existence. We Jews don't really have any particular observance of it nowadays either, except that, number one, there are certain prayers that we say on ordinary weekdays that we omit on holidays and that we omit on this holiday as well. So it does have something of a holiday status. And there are also some people who have a custom of adding some matzah, some unleavened bread to their meal on this holiday, which actually takes place tomorrow, as we shall see, the 14th day of the second month in the reckoning of the biblical calendar. But before we get there, we need, of course, to explore the background. As always, the premise of our discussion is not that we are discussing these holy days because they have direct, imminent relevance with respect to how we will observe them. But rather, this is part of the Torah, part of God's teaching to us. And as students of God's Word in the Holy Bible, and we are, after all, all students of God's Word in the Holy Bible, this day, like everything, certainly like all of the holy days that are described in the Bible, has a crucially important message to teach us, maybe even more than one. So it is on that note that we begin our journey in Numbers chapter 9. Beginning at the start of the chapter, verse 1, and God spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying, let the people of Israel keep the Passover at its appointed season. This is in the second year of the Exodus, the first anniversary of the first Passover. And, of course, the date is determined by the anniversary. In the 14th day of this month, this month being the month of the Exodus, the first month as designated at the beginning of Exodus chapter 12, the month of the Exodus, at evening, you shall keep it in its appointed season according to all the rites of it and according to all the ceremonies of it shall you keep it. And we read the discharging of this mission that God gives Moses in verse 4. And Moses spoke to the people of Israel that they should keep the Passover. And then, of course, what we read in verse 5 is, they did. And they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month at evening in the wilderness of Sinai. According to all that God commanded Moses, so did the people of Israel. So this is the observance of the first post-Exodus Passover. Everyone participated except not everyone. In verse 6, and there were certain men who were defiled by the dead body of a man who could not keep the Passover on that day. And they came before Moses and before Aaron on that day. And those men said to him, we are defiled by the dead body of a man 
Why are we kept back that we may not offer an offering of God in its appointed season among the people of Israel? They have a complaint. Now, in evaluating all of the relevant considerations with respect to their complaint, there is one conclusion, and really only one conclusion, that we can possibly reach, and that is they don't have a case. They don't have a case at all. That is, first of all, to appreciate the problem in being in a state of defilement, we read in Leviticus, in chapter 7, verses 20 and 21, a person who eats the meat of the sacrifice of peace offerings that pertain to God, having his defilement upon him, that soul shall be cut off from his people. Moreover, the person that shall touch any unclean thing, such as the defilement of man, or any unclean beast, or any abominable unclean thing, and eat of the meat of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which pertain to God, that soul shall be cut off from his people. Being cut off in Hebrew, karet, is an extremely severe punishment, which obviously means the sin is reckoned as an extremely severe sin. So, the first conclusion that we reach from Leviticus chapter 7 is they obviously cannot bring the Passover offering, which is an offering brought in the Holy Temple. Indeed, even entry into the precincts of the Temple is forbidden to them. And certainly partaking of the sacrificial meat of the Passover offering is likewise strictly forbidden because they're in a state of defilement. So they can't. But not only can they not bring the Passover offering, they also, as a result of their state of defilement, don't need to. That is, a fundamental principle with respect to the laws that God gives us in the Torah is that if a person is operating in a state of duress, circumstances that are beyond one's control, then one is not considered to be at blame at all. Even if inadvertently one commits what would otherwise be regarded as a severe sin, if one is operating in a state of duress, there is absolutely no culpability. All the more so if one can't perform a positive commandment because of state, such a state of duress. We learn this principle, among other places, in Deuteronomy in chapter 22. In verses 25 to 27. Now, the subject here is when a man has sexual relations with a betrothed woman that would be tantamount to adultery. In verse 25, in chapter 22, we read, if a man finds a betrothed woman in the field and a man forces her, he rapes her, then only the man who has relations with her shall die. But the woman you shall do nothing to. There is in this woman no sin worthy of death, worthy of any punishment. For as when a man rises against his neighbor and slays him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed maiden cried out, but there was none to save her. So, of course, under the circumstances, she simply isn't considered to be guilty. Again, because she's operating under duress. So, remember, first consideration, 
these people who are in a state of defilement cannot bring the Passover offering. It's forbidden to them. Second consideration is they don't need to. They're not considered culpable because they aren't bringing it. They aren't able to bring it. They're guiltless. Furthermore, there is yet another consideration here, and this, I must stress, is only intimated in Scripture, but in our tradition, it is likewise a foundational principle, and that is, if one fought to do a good deed, one wanted to do it, one strove to do it, but was prevented from doing it because of circumstances beyond one's control, then not only is there no blame for not having done it, but one receives credit, so to speak, by God, as if one did it. This is, in our tradition, intimated in the very last chapter of the Prophets. In Malachi, chapter 3, verse 16, we read, Then they who feared God spoke to one another, and God hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for those who revered God. And, and now I'm translating the last words of the verse in the Hebrew, literally, those who thought of his name. They only thought of God's name. They didn't actually succeed in doing anything in God's name. But once again, that reckoning by God, and that book of remembrance that was written before him for those who revered God also includes those who thought of God's name, even if it was only thought. So, of course, naturally, then, this is yet a third argument with respect to the case of those people who were in a state of defilement, that is, to review, consideration number one, they can't bring the Passover offering but they're in a state of defilement, and they are forbidden to bring it. Consideration number two was they aren't considered at all at blame because of circumstances beyond their control. Consideration number three is that while they aren't bringing the offering, because they were prevented from doing so because of considerations that were beyond their control, they are, as it were, considered to have done it. So they aren't even missing anything. So what's their problem? What's their complaint? There is yet a fourth consideration that I'm going to add to these, and I need to consider that this fourth consideration is in no place written or really even intimated in the Bible itself. But, you know, inevitably, the question arises in our tradition, how did these particular people enter into a state of defilement because of exposure to a dead body? Now, I realize, of course, we can answer that question on manifold plans. Obviously, in a nation the size of Israel at the time, undoubtedly, there were people who were dying on a relatively regular basis. But simultaneously, we could note that in considering the previous passages in the Torah, we could point to two particular passages that could explain why these people were in a state of defilement. The first of these passages is in the story of the Exodus. In Exodus chapter 13, verse 19, where we read, 
as Israel is leaving Egypt, and Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For he, Joseph, had laid an oath on the people of Israel, saying, God will surely take accounting of you, and you shall carry up my bones away from here with you. So as Israel marched to the promised land, Israel took with it the remains of Joseph. One possibility then is that these people who are in a state of defilement are in a state of defilement because they were the ones who were attending to Joseph's remains. Now, obviously, that is in itself doing a mitzvah, a good deed. Another possibility that is perhaps even more striking pertains to what we read in Leviticus chapter 10. At the beginning of Leviticus chapter 10, we read of the sin of Nadav and Avihu, the sons of Aaron, who took each of them his censer and put fire in it and put incense on it and offered strange fire before God, which he had not commanded. In chapter 10, verse 2, we read, And a fire went out, as it were, from before God, and devoured them, and they died before God. Now, in verse 4, we read, And Moses called Mishael and el the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary, from the tabernacle. They're dead inside the tabernacle, out of the camp. So they went near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. As Moses had said. If it is these people who are in the state of defilement, unable to bring the Passover offering, then of course, the state of defilement is because they were not only not failing to do something they should have been doing, but rather because they did what Moses had charged them to do. Of course, in either of these instances, either if it were the people who were attending to Joseph's remains, or Mishael and El-Safan, who were carrying the bodies of Nadab and Abihu out of the tabernacle, this is, in a sense, an even further amplification. These people had nothing at all to be ashamed of, nothing with respect to which they should feel sorry for themselves or guilty. On the contrary, they're in a state of defilement because they were doing good deeds. They were obeying God's word. They were tending to these dead people. And you know, in our tradition, when you tend to the deceased, it is the ultimate act of loving kindness because you're clearly doing it without any hope of reciprocity. The person who is the beneficiary of your kindness is never going to be able to pay you back in this world. So here they are, engaging in this ultimate act of loving kindness. And, of course, obviously, again, I reiterate, this isn't stated explicitly in the biblical text. And undoubtedly, the interpretation that it is these people who appear before Moses and Aaron in Numbers chapter 9 further amplifies that they don't have a case. The whole complaint is absurd. Once again, they can't bring the Passover offering clearly 
forbidden to them, but because it's forbidden to them, they aren't considered culpable at all. Not only that, they get credit as if they did it because they wanted to do it. And furthermore, this additional dimension, they may indeed have been unable to do it because they were themselves engaged in doing such a praiseworthy act of tending to these dead bodies. So again, no case at all. Completely absurd complaint. They had no business being upset that they weren't bringing the Passover offering. And of course, simultaneously we recognize there's nothing you can do. The offerings, after all, has to be brought on time. Once the day ends, the time is up, the offering is passed. Normally, there is no second chance. And yet, returning to Numbers chapter 9, after they voiced their complaint, Moses, perplexingly, says to them, stand still, stand by, and I will hear what God will command concerning you. That is, of course, Moses extraordinarily has the ultimate recourse to answering such questions by immediately receiving the answer from God himself. And it is that which we read in the verses that follow. God spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, If any man of you or of your posterity, note, this isn't just going to be an answer to these individuals who are in a state of defilement. This is a new rule to apply for your posterity for all generations. If any man of you or of your posterity shall be defiled by reason of a dead body or be on a journey afar off, afar off, of course, from Jerusalem, because offerings can only be brought in the Holy Temple. Yet, he shall keep the Passover to God. But how? When? In verse 11, on the 14th day of the second month, at evening, they shall keep it, and eat it with unleavened bread, with matzah, and bitter herbs. They shall leave none of it to the morning, nor break any bone of it. These are all rules that apply to the first Passover, the one that takes place on the 14th day of the first month. And indeed, by summation, God says, according to all the ordinances of the Passover, they shall keep it. I'm giving them a second chance. Now, of course, after I built up my case for why they didn't have a case, why the question was completely absurd, the complaint unfounded, the demand out of place. After all that, God accepts the complaint. God answers them. God gives them the second Passover. God gives them a second chance. Which really, when one considers the implications, is simply extraordinary. That is, perhaps we could say, in a sense, that, you know, in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 4, we read as a kind of summation for the five books of the Torah, the five books of Moses. Moses commanded us a Torah, a teaching. 
the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. We've discussed in other contexts that the Torah, the five books of Moses, represent an organic whole, distinct from all the rest of the Bible, the natural tradition. Well, Moses commanded us concerning the Torah, the teaching. And yet, in a sense, he commanded us everything except this. Of course I say, in a sense, because you would be right to object and say, well, you know, we got this rule about a second Passover also through Moses. And so God spoke to Moses. God gave Moses the answer. And of course that's true. But in some sense, the implication in the text is the answer came because these people had demanded such an answer. Because despite the fact that the request was absurd, it was sincere. And when all that matters is that sincerity, I don't want to be exempt. I don't even want to get extra credit because I couldn't do it even though I wanted to. I want to do it. I want to feel that closeness. When there is that measure of sincerity, God answers. Perhaps this idea is one that we can express in a broad, expansive way in terms of a principle that in our tradition is not only foundational, but intimated in all of the components of the Hebrew Bible, in the Torah, in the prophets, and in the holy writings. The principle is on whatever way a person wants to go, he is taken. You choose the course. Once you've chosen, God will walk you on that course. And it applies, I must stress, for better and for worse. That is, the first that exemplifies this principle in the Torah, in the five books of Moses, is in Numbers chapter 22, verse 20. To give a bit of background, in chapter 22, we read of the messengers whom Balak sends to Bil'am to persuade Bil'am to come to curse Israel. And when Bil'am awaits God's permission to go on this mission to curse Israel, in verse 12, God said to Bil'am, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. But then there's another set of messengers more prestigious messengers with promises of gifts. Prestigious messengers, promises of gifts. There is no earthly reason to imagine that that should change God's verdict. But when Bil'am again solicits God's permission, kind of nagging God, can I go, can I go? So God's response in verse 20 is, if the men come to call you, if you see it as a call to you, you may rise up and go with them. But only the word which I shall say to you, you shall do. So Bilam goes. And of course, he goes to his disgrace and ultimately, to his death. But if you want to go, you can go. Whatever way 
you choose, you will be taken on. That's, of course, in a negative sense. In a far more positive sense, the verse that exemplifies this principle in the prophets is in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 17. And once again, I'm going to be meticulous in translating literally. So the translation might diverge slightly from what you have, but I'm doing so based upon the original text. Thus says God, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am God, your Lord, who teaches you for your benefit who leads you by the way upon which you go. In the Hebrew, Madrichecha b'derech telech, again, who leads you on the way on which you go. You've chosen to go on that way. Now I'll lead you on. Now, of course, here it certainly is in a positive sense. After all, I am God your Lord, who teaches you for your benefit, for your benefit. You've chosen to go on that course, on that way that will be for your benefit. Because you chose that, I will lead you on it. It's your choice. You chose the way. And as a final illustration from the Holy Writings in the book of Proverbs, we actually find both sides of this coin expressed in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. Surely he, God, scorns the scorners, but he gives grace to the humble. So those who have chosen to cast themselves as scorners get scorned. That's the way they chose. That's the way they are taken on. And those who choose the course of humility, that's the way they chose. They get grace. That's the way they are taken on. It's all up to us in that sense. We choose where we want to go. And God's gift is, that's where you want to go, that's where you're going. Of course, the great gift here is God's empowering us. There is no greater expression of God's confidence in us than enabling us to take the lead. And of course, returning to Numbers chapter 9, these people took the lead. They showed themselves, the world, God, what way it was upon which they had chosen to go. So God takes them. Perhaps a good way of expressing this using another passage in the Bible is in Psalm 73. In verse 26, and I think this verse so aptly describes the attitude of these people. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. If you feel that God is your portion forever, you don't look for exemptions. You're not even looking for absentee credit. You want to feel God is my portion forever. Because, as expressed in verse 28, as for me, nearness of God is my good. The way I define good is by being close to God. I don't want to give up on that opportunity to come close to God through doing what he bids us to do. 
to living his word. If God is my portion, I seek to actualize that in my deeds. Even if I'm exempted, even if I would get credit without doing it, I do it. Perhaps even more aptly to consider another verse in Psalms. In Psalm 119, verse 57. Much the same theme here. God is my portion. I have said that I would keep your words. Or perhaps we could translate, I have committed myself to keeping your words. And I think there's a critical theme expressed here that is directly germane with respect to Numbers chapter 9, and of course, with respect to each and every one of us. Again, biblical holy days and their messages. What does it convey to us? That if I truly feel God is my portion. If I really feel that bond to God, then necessarily that sense demands of me expressing it in practice. It's not just some kind of vague abstraction in my mind. It's something that I do. So if I really feel that God is my portion, then I commit myself to keeping your words. Not just thinking about your words. Even when, under normal circumstances, I couldn't do anything more than that because I was operating under duress, because I was barred from acting on those thoughts. I'm not satisfied with that. Because I want that sense that God is my portion to permeate my entire being. Not just my mind, not just my thoughts, my body, everything. I'm going to do it. I want to live by those words, not just think about them. So I'm not satisfied merely hearing that I'm exempt or even hearing that I get absentee credit because I couldn't do it. I'm going to do it. And that's the complaint that elicits God's answer. You know, Returning to those words that we saw a few minutes ago in the last chapter of the prophets, in Malachi, chapter 3, we spoke about those who revered God and thought of his name. And what does God say of them? In Malachi chapter 3, verse 17, And they shall be mine, says the God of hosts, on that day which I appoint as my particular day, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Verse 18, Then you shall return and see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and him that does not serve him. In our tradition, that second distinction between him that serves God and him that does not serve him is a distinction in which both sides are describing the righteous. That is, besides distinguishing between the righteous and the wicked, even among the righteous, ironically, there are those who serve God and those who are described, even though they're righteous, as not really serving. That is, when you look for exemptions, when you look for the easy way out, a legitimate way, a legal way, but an easy way. You're serving yourself. You're not really serving them. You're not really saying, 
God is my portion forever. And that's saying, I'm committing myself to keeping his words because he is my portion. That is, perhaps it would be appropriate for us to invoke a principle here. This is a concept, a turn of phrase that doesn't appear in the Bible, but certainly is suffused with the ideas that we've just described. In the Hebrew, the expression is lifnim mishurat hadin. Now, I'm citing the expression in Hebrew because, to be perfectly honest with you, I can't translate it. That is, I can tell you how the expression lifnim mishurat hadin is usually translated into English, but it's a bad translation. The usual translation is beyond the letter of the law. That one isn't merely doing what one needs to do, one is going above and beyond. The problem with that translation is lifnim does not mean beyond. Lifnim actually means within. A literal translation, which of course idiomatically doesn't make sense, would be lifnim mishurat adin, within the line of the law, within the letters. Or perhaps a better idiom to use here is to read between the lines. It's not going above and beyond because, you know, if you go above and beyond, you're going out of bounds. When you go to excess, more is by no means necessarily better. Sometimes it could be positively bad. But if you have integrated into yourself, into your mind and into your heart, what the letter of the law is, you know how to read the lines. At some point, you become imbued with an attitude, an orientation, an orientation that takes you between the lines and enables you even to intuit what the right course is, even when nothing compels me to follow that course and the right one. This idea of lifnim mishurat adin, reading between the lines, is one that in our tradition is intimated in the words that we read in Exodus chapter 18, verse 20, that is the instruction that Jethro bids Moses give to the judges who will join him in leadership of the people. You shall teach them the ordinances and the teachings and shall show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. There are the well-defined teachings. There are the specific mandates that need to be observed. But then there's also something more than that. There is the way in which they must walk and the work that they must do. And that necessarily impels them to something more than merely the line reading the letters. It impels them to read between the lines. And this is something that we should stress is clearly a point of emphasis, not just in the formal work of the judges, but altogether in interpersonal relationships. This is 
an idea that in our tradition is most aptly intimated in the instruction we read in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Beginning in verse 17, but with a focus on verse 18. Verse 17, you shall diligently keep the commandments of God your Lord and his testimonies and his statutes that he has commanded you. Obviously, these are well-defined, quantified obligations. But then there's also, and you shall do that which is right and good in the sight of God, that it may be well with you and that you may come in and possess the good land that God swore to your fathers. What's included in the beginning of that verse? You shall do that which is right and good in the sight of God. You know, if it's simply referring to keeping the laws that God has already bidden us to observe, then it's just redundant. It's more than that. In our tradition, what that implies is, after you've kept all the laws, once you've already integrated what you need to do, the letters start reading between the lines. Have those rules engender an attitude, an attitude that I want to do what is right and good in the eyes of God. Not just because it is required, but because I've integrated into myself an attitude that goes beyond what is specifically required. And maybe in a sense that is more closely relevant to the second Passover, you know, in Leviticus, we have so many rules that pertain to sanctification. Very specific laws that have to do with forbidden relationships and forbidden actions. And then after all of those specific rules, we read in Leviticus chapter 19, in verses 1 and 2, God spoke to Moses saying, speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy. For I, God, your Lord, am holy. Well, again, what does that mean? Does it mean all the rules that you already received? Well, if that were the case, this is redundant. And what altogether is intended by saying, for I, God, your Lord, am holy? That once you've learned all the rules, you should be transformed as a person. You should have an attitude that strives for holiness, that strives to integrate godliness into your life, to make you into a more godly human being. Once you reach that level, and indeed, you intuit something that God hasn't even said yet, that to others might even seem absurd, but it's an expression of your having integrated that godliness into your life. Not going above and beyond. Not going out of bounds. But of course, I commit myself to keeping your words. Not only your words that formally obligate me, your words, because I'm striving to keep them as much as I can to make myself into a more godly human being. So, it is on that note that we consider the second Passover. Again, something that doesn't really apply when we don't have a holy temple in which to bring an offering for Passover on either the first Passover or the second Passover. But its message certainly does. A message that, first of all, stresses to us when you really are striving to come close to God there will be a second chance
And most of all, that by your striving to integrate that godliness into your life, God will respond. The way upon which you wish to go, you will go. God bless you.